Hello, everybody. Um, my talk is called Groovy Integration Testing with Spock and Docker. And of course, that's a play on, on words you can always do with Groovy. So it will be uh, some Groovy techniques how to do integration testing. But we'll also see uh, how to use the Groovy languages or tools from the Groovy ecosystem to allow for maybe better integration testing strategies. So my name is Kevin. Um, I work um, at um, GData Advanced Analytics. It's a, it's a German uh, security software company. Um, we are a daughter company from the G, uh, GData software, and GData software is um, one of the bigger, one of the biggest um, antivirus software uh, companies in Germany. And um, our subcompany is specialized in building special security software for enterprise customers like anomaly detection systems and so on. And um, I also um, have my own small company where I work as a consultant in, in different companies for different customers where I might consult in topics such as continuous integration, building continuous integration systems, um, TDD clean code and so on. Um, I have here a link to my blog. It's called Groovy Coder. Um, I haven't blocked that much recently. In theory, you find there are a lot of stuff about testing, and there are some blog posts about Spock, how to use Spock with Spring Boot, and so on. Twitter handle my GitHub link. Okay, so what I like uh, you to learn in in this lesson, in this talk, is the following. I want to show you that nowadays, thanks to using technologies like Docker, like containers, it's quite easy to set up a complete test environment on your local dev machine as well. And um, because of this, nowadays, there's not a lot of effort needed to write integration tests using real applications. So for example, in Gradles, if you're writing an integration test, it would a database integration test, it would normally use an H2 in memory database. And that might be OK for a lot of use cases. But sometimes you want the real deal. You want to test against your Postgres database or whatever. and um, I will show you how to do it in an in a easy fashion. And um, I'll also uh, introduce you to a um, Spock extension I've, I've written, and which is now part of a bigger, bigger um, open source project. Um, it's, um, it's a Spock extension for starting and stopping and Docker containers. And I want to give you a quick overview about the history of this um, extension, because it might be something you might learn something about how you, how you could design an API or whatever. Um, and um, the, the code example, it's, this is what I want from all um, projects in the future. May it be open source project, may it be enterprise project. That I want the new developer to be able to come into the company, to do a checkout of the repository, do a Gradle build or whatever build, and it should build the application, it should run the integration test on their local machine without needing them to set up any test environment whatsoever. OK, before we go into the more technical details, let's first discuss quickly semantics here. Um, I said integration testing, and um, the word itself isn't so really well defined. So everybody might have um, a different own interpretation of what an integration test is, where an integration test resides in the software testing pyramid. I personally uh, like this version of the software testing pyramid very much because um, it actually visualizes that um, the middle layer where the integration tests reside is kind of fuzzy. You can't really say, oh, this is an integration test, now this is a component test, API test. You can, you can find a definition for you or your team, but in general, developers might, um, might define it differently. And so uh, what I will talk about with integration tests is generally the completely middle layer. And the tools I will show you are um, usable for the middle layer as well as for the top, so the automated UI testing, functional testing, acceptance testing stuff. So if I talk about integration tests, I mean the middle layer of this testing pyramid. OK, yeah, so this is a classical testing pyramid we uh, learn to love or hate or whatever when working with monolithic applications, mainly. And now what about microservices? Maybe there are different patterns, a different testing pyramid when working with microservices, when developing microservices. And uh, I found this nice um, 
picture on Martin Fowler's blog about the testing pyramid or testing architecture for microservices. And um, I haven't really looked um, very deep into it, but what you can see is that there might be some more complex uh, concepts involved when uh, integration testing your microservice architecture because you have to keep so much more in mind, like the bounded contacts, the API contracts, and so on. It might be even more difficult and complicated to test your microservice architecture than it was to test your monolithic applications before, and that's something you have to keep in mind. But the tool I'm going to show you, or the concepts, works really well for microservices in general as well. So, now, my concrete definition of what an integration test is for me, it's a test which interacts with external systems or dependencies. That uh, would be everything with, which might, for example, launch an application server, which would be um, the Spring Boot integration test, or in the Grails world, the Grails integration test would launch the application server as well, or the um, framework context. Um, then the framework or library interactions that are integration tests for me as well, because now I'm testing the integration between my code and the framework or the library. And uh, of course, the classic example might be tests which interact with external ports. If I say external ports here, I'm thinking about a hexagonal architecture pattern where everything which interacts with the outside world of your application is defined as a port. And that would mean um, code that interacts with the network or the file system or the database, which is a perfect classic example, I think. So. Now, which tools do we use for developing modern integration tests in the JVM world? I think most of you will know most of the tools on this image. We have uh, JEP for writing great um, acceptance tests or functional tests. We have um, the rocket is like the unof unofficial logo from Spock. I'm not sure if Spock has a real official logo, but yeah, the, rock was, uh, the rocket symbolizes Spock. We can use Groovy, of course. Uh, we've uh, seen the talk by, by Paul about um, using Groovy for testing and for testing Java applications as well. Uh, we can use Docker, and what I want to introduce in this talk especially is the um, tool on the, on the bottom right, and it's called Test Containers, and that's a special library I'll introduce later, and I'll show you examples how to use this. Okay, I, s I think I can skip this, so who of you knows about Spock? It's, I think, everyone, nearly everyone. Okay, real quick, you know how it goes. That's the Spock test, a simple example. I think we can skip it. So, the next technology, um, who knows about Docker or uses Docker? Okay, who doesn't use Docker or doesn't know a lot about Docker? Yeah, there are some. So I will, I will try to give you a quick overview of what Docker is, because I think you need to understand this. Um, so basically, you have um, the kernel of the operating system, and now Docker is a container technology. What is a container? A container is um, a set of um, application of, of binaries which runs on top of your kernel. So for example, you could have... Um, a container which consists of a Java installation in a Debian system environment and which has a Tomcat, classical Java Tomcat stack. Or you could have the same for, uh, for a Microsoft stack nowadays since we have .NET Core and SQL Server on Linux now. So we see uh, on the right there is, in the, in the middle there is a Windows web stack. Or you could uh, even just put your static binary into the container, then you don't need any dependencies. So the, la uh, the example on the right, Alpine, it's a uh, very small Linux distribution as well. But if you put a static binary into it, into a container, you could even um, take away the underlying um, operation system, user space uh, operation system, because if you set a binary, you might not need any external dependencies. So it's also possible to build containers from scratch, so they only contain a static binary. For example, it's done a lot in the Go or in the Rust world and so on. And yeah, they are all running on the same kernel. So often people like to compare um, a container and the container technology to a virtual machine. And it's an easy metaphor but it's a quite wrong one and you, you get a, a bad um, idea about what containers are. Because the difference is um, the um, amount of isolation you're getting. 
if you are using containers, um, all your containers are still running on the same host operation system, using the same Docker engine underneath, using the same kernel underneath. So you have, you have kind of an isolation, but they're still interacting on the same kernel, so using the same parts of the memory of the machine, to, so to say. And uh, of course, you have ways to restrict it, but it isn't a hard isolation. It's different if you are um, using a, a virtual machine where you have a basic infrastructure which contains a hypervisor and um, which has, uh, where a virtual machine has its own kernel, its own operating system. So if you want real isolation, container might not be the solution. You uh, might still want to use VMs. And of course, you can mix and match both, and that's a nice thing about it. Just think about uh, Docker or containers as a tool to package applications, to run applications. And if you want real isolation, you can use a virtual machine. Just uh, like we see here, we have a virtual machine which might run Docker containers. So that's as, as a small Docker intro. So now, why uh, do we want to combine what we've seen with Spock and with Docker? What uh, we want to achieve is an easy setup of a dev and test environment. And we want the test and dev environment to look the same on uh, the developer machines, maybe, and the same on the CI system. So it should be somehow self-contained. The project itself should be self-contained to be built and tested the same way in all environments. And um, ideally, we don't want the developers to install or set up any external software, additional external software whatsoever, like a database or whatever, uh, except, of course, Docker. They would need Docker. And depending on your setup, you need, of course, uh, Java or whatever to build your application. And yeah, like I said before, that's uh, a point I'd like to reach for, for most projects and open source projects, that new developers can simply check out the project and build it, and it's tested and everything. Integration tested, yeah. So now, how do we um, fuse both worlds together? Uh, if we combine the words together, we get Spock plus Docker is equals Spocker, which was uh, my first idea of naming the extension. And uh, let's have a look how the first iteration of the um, Spock Docker extension looked like. So what uh, we wanted to achieve was a way to specify um, which containers or which container environment should be set up for which test. So my idea back then was um, based on my experience with the um, Spring Boot testing framework, which is very heavily annotation based. I thought it would be nice to have an uh, annotation at my class or at my method level where I describe which containers I would need um, for this test. And um, this was like the first commit, and it was already uh, implemented like this. So this was a working example of the first commit. And in this case, you see an annotation at class level, which would mean um, this um, container is, um, um, is, uh, star is started um, in, in the setup spec life cycle around it. And um, it will be accessible to all test methods, so to all features in Spock words. Um, but you could also uh, put this annotation onto, um, onto a, a test method, and then it would um, start the container before the test method, clean it up afterwards. So yeah, that was uh, the basic idea, and we already used it in production and so on, and it, yeah, you, you could use it. For, for simple stuff, you could use it like this. So this is a stupid example with this, um, who am I container, why would you test something with it? But you could use a database as well for this example. And what you see here um, is um, you specify the ports that are bound to the host, like you, in the syntax you use with Docker as well. And that's, that's already something which seems kind of smelly. So we come back later to this. But in general, um, you shouldn't make any assumption about the system you're running on. So here in this test, I say I want to bind my port 8080 on my um, development machine to the, or my host machine, to the port 80 of the container. And here I make the assumption that the port 8080 is still uh, open. So, but I don't know, maybe another application is running. Maybe, I don't know, I think if you are running Skype, it blocks port 80 or something. So, uh, yeah, this is already kind of smelly. We come back later to this. Um, so the, to the actual uh, implementation, I don't want to go much into detail, just skim over it real quick. That's, uh, that was the interceptor of the Spock, of the Spock extension. Um, 
and the extension simply has this like callback method intercept spec execution and it will start the container proceed with the test and stop the container afterward and it was yeah that was really all that was to it and um, the actual implementation of this docker client facade was uh, in my first in the first version was based on the docker um, java library so this Java, Docker Java library is uh, heavily static typed. It's quite Java-like to work with it. And um, yeah, you have see, just look at things like this. Um, if you wanted to run an image, of course, the image must exist on your machine. So normally, if you do a Docker run with the image name, Docker will look if it has the um, image available in its cache. And if not, it would pull the image and run it. Now, with, if you wanted to interact with the Docker Java library, it would simply throw an exception if uh, you didn't have um, the image and so on. So it wasn't very convenient and Docker-like to use it. So in this example, you had to first look for the um, image if it was there. If not, it throw an exception. So that was like the official API way to interact and see if an image was on the system or not. And then you had to pull it manually. Not very, very nice, but it, but it worked. And um, then I looked around and I thought, okay, I don't really like this Docker Java library. And I found this um, groovy Docker client library. It's uh, by, by Tobias Geselchen, um, who also has a cool um, Docker Gradle plugin. And uh, the code we, we found here, it's basically the same here. It's, it's the same functionality now as groovy. So this is a, it's a great library. If you ever want to interact with um, Docker in a Groovy project or so, I strongly suggest you at least look into this version of the um, library, the, the Groovy version of the library. So yeah, that was the first, um, the second iteration. And then uh, something happened. Sergey, who is uh, also um, uh, um, a Groovy uh, contributor, you might uh, have heard yesterday by Agrovisimo that he was the one who um, implemented micro methods into, um, into Groovy. And um, he uh, raised an issue in the GitHub project and he said, oh, interesting looking extension you're building there. But look, there's already a, a library, a bigger project, which achieves something similar to what you want to do. It's for Java only, but maybe you guys want to switch over to um, this library and build a Spocker extension for this library. So and that was actually a lucky thing that this happened. Because let's take a quick look. Um, the library was call, is called Test Containers. It's um, a Java library and it's a JUnit library for, um, for having containers in your JUnit test, for starting and stopping containers for your JUnit test. So basically the same thing we wanted to achieve with a Spock with a, a Spock extension. And um, yeah, let's have a quick, uh, quick look how you would use it. Uh, you wouldn't use any annotations or whatsoever. You would um, define uh, an object which would describe a container. In this ca uh, case, it's a generic container, so it could um, consist of any image. You would um, give it an image name, expose ports, and so on. And then you would, um, to integrate it with JUnit, you would use a class rule or a rule. Yeah, so I said, uh, I thought it's cool, it's already implementing all the Docker features uh, I still would have needed to re-implement in, uh, in the Spock extension I was writing. So I thought, let's give it a go. It does other convenient stuff like um, looking for um, orphan containers which are still running, which weren't uh, shut down correctly and so on. So it does a lot of heavy lifting for you. And uh, that's, that's the general feature set. Um, so it has uh, support for generic containers, like you can uh, uh, use it for any container you have an image for. Mm. So, but it also has um, some special um, objects and special support for some specialized containers, like databases, which give you additional convenient methods, like Selenium, which give you additional convenient methods to instantiate containers which already contain a Firefox or a Chrome or whatever. You could also just pinpoint it to a um, Docker file and it will build the container for you. There is even a DSL included where you could um, define the Docker file uh, over in J a Java API. 
Uh, there was already Docker Compose support included, and um, that's a great deal. There's something really cool which is called a wait strategy. So there's one thing if you want to use these containers and tests. Mm, a good example is the Postgres database. You want to um, wait with your test until um, the Postgres database has um, started correctly, until it starts to is um, ready to interact with you. And um, if you start, if you've ever started a Postgres container, you will see um, uh, it's it will uh, the, the call will return immediately, but it's still in the process of starting um, the actual database engine. So, what does this mean? The container is running already, of course, but inside there is a process setting up the table, setting up the database, and uh, in case of Postgres, it does even. Um, it does even restart. So the Postgres container, if you start it, it will start the database, it will do some setup, it will then restart the database engine to um, make use of its um, new setup uh, configuration or whatever, and then after this quite long period of time, it will be ready to accept JDBC connections. So if you start a container like the Postgres and you say, I wanted to listen to port 5432, and you just wait for this TCP port to be available to give you um, a correct TCP response, it might not be enough for your test to interact with this database because the um, TCP server of the Postgres is already listening on this port, but the engine hasn't been initialized yet. And so um, this library has um, special support for providing different wait strategies in case of an database container, it might be useful to have a JDBC-based wait strategy, which would mean I wait until this container accepts a JDBC connection. Or uh, recently we've impl implemented something which sounds like a stupid idea, but it's actually one of the best wait strategies. It's to wait uh, until um, a specific text was locked by the container. That's the most robust way for most containers to find out when they are really ready. And um, yeah, Tescon has, has additional support for uh, Docker environment discovery, so it will work with Docker machine, uh, it will work in general on, on Windows with Docker for Windows, Docker for Mac, it will just use the configured Docker environment. Which would mean you could in theory even have uh, the Docker engine running on some other host as well. So in the first step, we've substituted only the Docker, uh, Docker library with the test containers library and um, still, still use the annotation stuff and, and so, so everything. So it wasn't fully embraced into the extension, it was only used as a Docker library, a more convenient Docker library. And uh, yeah, we don't have to go over the code, it's not so interesting. You see it's a bit more code than the Groovy library, but uh, it already has a lot more features like you can um, provide an environment, environment variables, you can provide a wait strategy and so on. So in the end it was uh, substituting was very easy as well. And um, then once the uh, features started to creep in into the uh, extension, um, there was a question if it's really a good idea to um, define this environment using annotations. For example, for the waste strategy, you might want to provide um, uh, um, an, an object here and annotations aren't really good for values which aren't primitive values. So we had this hack with enclosure and in general it got, the test got unmaintainable, unreadable. It wasn't so nice after all to go with this annotation strategy. And then we looked to the JUnit version of how to integrate it and then we thought Maybe let's just um, fully embrace that we are now using test containers in this extension. We don't need any wrapper for set library whatsoever. And uh, just make use of uh, like this convention over configuration stuff which uh, other groovy tools use, which Spock uses in a lot of places. And let's say the following. We just put these uh, containers as fields, as fields in the test and in, in the Spock extension, we look if there are container fields um, uh, in the specification, in the class, and then we'll start and stop them accordingly. So I think it, uh, it works very well with the whole um, Spock paradigm and so on. And you could already easily um, integrate it with existing Spock features like the shared annotation. 
So for example, if you would um, add, the, add shared annotation to a field, this would mean this container is shared between all tests in the, um, in the specification in this test class. If you would omit the add shared annotation, this would mean the container would restart between tests. Not only restart, it would be, re would be recreated, which might be something you want to use if you don't want to take care about cleaning up after your tests, like if you are interacting with the database. So you can just write whatever you want, afterwards you will get a fresh, fresh database. And of course it takes some time, so you always have to consider what do I value more, do I um, want a faster t uh, time for my integration test, or is it more important to, have, uh, to not clean up because it might, might be cumbersome, there might be some leaky test, test data pollution. That's something you always have to consider. That's not like this is a solution for everything. So, yeah, enough talking. Let's go to a demo and see some stuff in real action. So, uh, who here knows and uses Spring Boot? Uh, some. And who uses Grails? A lot more. Uh, so, sadly, all the, exp uh, um, the, all the examples, which are like real-world examples, are for Spring Boot. But since you're all using... Um, Grails, you're implicitly using Spring Boot as well, so maybe it's okay. And uh, I'll have a workshop about this whole library, about this whole concept later at uh, 2 o'clock, I think, and there we will use Grails, so you will see these techniques applied uh, for Grails. So we have a really, really simple, really stupid application. We have one entity, which is a book entity with just one field, uh, two fields and an ID, and um, if you're using Spring Boot, you, um, as an or object relational mapper, um, it isn't like GORM, you would have this repository pattern, Spring Data repositories. So this book repository you would use to save the book. And um, now let's look into the test and um, let's first look into the basic setup for a test which will use a shared database. Now this code is a bit more complex but the reason behind this is only because you have to uh, configure, you have to instrument the Spring Boot application, the application context, before it starts. So if you are not familiar with Spring Boot, maybe you don't have to think about this stuff. But the idea behind it is that I, I said before, it's a smelly way, a pollutive way to bind to real whole, uh, ports on your host. So you might never know which ports are free on your host. So what test containers automatically does, it's, um, it will um, bind to a free port, so it will still bind to the, port, uh, to the host, but it will bind to a free port, and it will provide you with methods to um, receive the actual port it's running on at runtime, after the container has started. So you have to use this pattern where you start the container, then look at which port and at which IP it's actually running. Because as I said before, the Docker engine might be running on a different system, which would mean you have like some IP or some DNS resolution or whatsoever. So you can't know before the test where the container will actually run. So you get this configuration data, the, the IP, the port and so on. What I'm doing here with um, this method, that's a convenient method of the Postgres SQL container, which is a specialized container, and uh, this will already return at runtime once the container has started uh, the JDBC URL you can use to interact with this container. So it's actually really convenient, but it's sometimes a pain in the ass to get this configuration at runtime into your application context. And it's, it's the same with Grails, you have the same problems there. So it's really a problem with uh, integrating it into the frameworks. And the way to do it in Spring is to have this um, custom application context initializer which you can um, which you can configure here as a context configuration. This should work in theory in Grails as well but I tried it out and I didn't, it didn't work because um, the transformation of the um, um, or the global transformation of the add integration test annotation from Grails will automatically add the add context configuration and it seems that it's two times there and it didn't really work. But there are other strategies for Grails as well and I will show it in the, in the workshop later. So, yeah, this is a, a, a abstract class and then you can extend, for example, this class to, um, to use the setup, use the uh, database in your test. So, now this is... Um, 
the actual test and I extend this um, abstract base class where I do all the setup, setup stuff and um, now I have this at stepwise annotation by Spock. So I want, in this test, I want to make sure that it's really a shared uh, database instance. So I first check um, the repository should be empty, then I save a book, and um, then it, um, afterwards in the last test, it should contain this book. So, what if I do this? Okay, now it's running, and uh, the Docker Java library is actually super noisy. I think it has something to do with the underlying Netty library. It will print out like a hex-based hex uh, representation of the TCP stack all the time, or the TCP communication, strange. Now here we see um, it's um, starting the Postgres container, it has already started, and now it's running there. Oh, I'm actually running the wrong test. It's uh, another test class. I noticed because it's restarting the database. <laughs> it was running the exclusive te test. Okay, and let's again run the shared database test. You see the container has started. Yeah, and test green. And now we see uh, Ah, the containers are away, great. So, um, okay, um, there's another example where I use an exclusive database. I will skip it, it's basically the same, just that it's this time you won't use a shared instance. And uh, just what I want to show as a general idea, so you can get the bigger picture, is this test where we will uh, test the interaction, the integration with the Mongo database. Um, it's the same strategy, uh, it's an addi additional container in this case as a field, in this case a generic container because there isn't a specialized container for uh, MongoDB and then you just uh, provide, um, um, provide test containers with the image name uh, and you say which port will be exposed, so which will be the port you want to interact with. Um, I didn't have to configure a waiting strategy for MongoDB because I think MongoDB is only, only starts listening at the TCP port once it has initialized. And here we see the example how to get at runtime the real port um, from test containers. So it has this method get map port, then you give the port you wanted to expose at the, in, the, in the container and then it will give you the real map port on your host. Stepwise again, we have a shared uh, database. It started a Mongo, it's also started a Postgres. And that's because I've um, also defined this um, Postgres container instance in this test. The reason why I did it is because Spring Boot won't even start up if it can't connect um, to its, uh, if it can't initialize its object, object creation mapper correct. Yeah, so test screen, everything fine. That's one way how to use your application from within your application. Now, uh, there's also another, uh, another way to use test containers and it's for acceptance testing. or well, integration testing as well. What I mean in this case, I have um, a multitude of containers which is of services which together describe a system and test this whole system, that it works as expected. So I would call this an acceptance test or sometimes functional test maybe. And um, what we will use here uh, for this is Docker Compose. Who knows Docker Compose? Yeah, some, quite a lot. It's a tool by Docker, uh, Docker Inc., um, which allows you to describe a, a system which consists of multiple services which are itself Docker containers. So, in this example, we will look at the following, um, following system, which consists of 
uh, of uh, five actual different images, different containers. Um, it's the example from the DockerCon 2016, the voting app. I will just show you in a minute how it looks. And um, oh, let's do it now. So to start a Docker Compose uh, project, you have just to say Docker Compose op. And so that's uh, front end. for displaying the results. Now if I should get, yeah. Okay, so of course this is a correct answer. <laughs> to use Docker Compose is you describe the services in an uh, YML file, and YAML file. We don't have to go over the syntax here. It's just, uh, you can see this is a one service, another service, WorkerDB, and so on. And, uh, of course, you can use JEP for your um, functional testing, for your acceptance testing. I won't explain JEP because I think all of you know, or most of you. And if not, look it up, it's perfect. And let's see how to acceptance test an application. So, what I'm doing now is I'm again using um, test containers. At this time, I'm not using the um, test containers, um, Spock test containers um, extension because uh, I want to manually start and stop uh, the um, containers where I think it's most useful in the test life cycle. Just uh, it's, it's a bit tricky what I'm doing here because I have this Docker Compose which de describes my system. I want to test system under test. And then I'll also use a special container, a browser web driver container. It's a special container by test containers. You can um, configure it with desired capabilities like having a Chrome, like having a Firefox. It will have a Chrome. It will have the Chrome web driver to uh, to be used for Selenium testing, and of course, JEP is only a DSL for writing Selenium. Now, what I wanted to do is, since I don't know um, where the containers, at which port they will be running um, once they've, uh, the Docker Compose has, has raised them, because I can't map to constant ports on my system because I don't know if they are open, I thought, let's just leverage the Docker networking capabilities. And um, now what I'm doing here, uh, and that's what I'm doing manually because it isn't uh, yet possible in the extension in such a way. Find out the ID of the Docker Compose has been initialized. So Docker Compose will, as a default, automatically initialize, uh, create a Docker network for you, and all containers will be inside the Docker network, and they will talk will be able to talk to each other using the container name as, as an alias, as a network alias. And now I'm, I'm getting this, um, this network, the network the Docker Compose is using, Selenium container into this network. So this is able, as we see here, to interact with the system using DNS-like um, name resolution. So if I go to vote, it will go to the vote service, to the vote container. Uh, yeah, that's, that's the reason why I would do it manually here. Mm. And uh, there is, there's another nice thing we will see, see now. Uh, or just a moment, I will uh, quickly explain the test. It's a stepwise test as well. Um, it will go um, to the um, application first. We'll look that it displays as you expect it. Then it will go to the results. Results should be 50-50 at first because there hasn't been any votes yet. Then it will click uh, vote for Groovy and then it will look that uh, Groovy has 100%. Please don't look at the JEPs uh, tests specifically, they are really bad JEP tests. And uh, I have the sleeps here, and Marcin already said, me, said to me, never use sleep in JEP specs. Of course, you don't. Be over in an instance, and then you can't see what's happening. So, presentation. Mm. Now I'm, I'm running it in debug mode now, 
now. And the reason why I do this is because I want to uh, quickly stop at this point because you will be able um, to get um, the VNC address. Um, so the Selenium container, the special Selenium container, also uh, is uh, accessible using VNC protocol, so you can look inside what's happening on the uh, virtual display. And um, now I want to stop here, then I want to con connect to the um, VNC server running inside, um, inside the container so we can see what's actually happening. This is the URL. So, now we are looking at the browser, at the Chrome, inside the Selenium container. And if I continue, we see Jeb instrumenting the web driver, instrumenting the Chrome, performing the tests. And test screen, perfect. Okay. <laughs> It works, yeah. And uh, I, I will give you, uh, at the end of the slides, there are the links to, the, um, to my repositories. So the examples are in repositories. And uh, if you clone this example, it will work out of the box. You don't have to do anything. Of course, you need uh, uh, right now Grail and Docker, but then it will work out of the box. No setup needed, no Selenium cluster. You have Selenium grid you have to configure. No web drivers to install will work out of the box. No. Okay. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe just real quick, I don't want to go into detail here. Now, if you want, if you have your continuous integration, um, it's possible to use the same techniques. It's possible uh, to use test containers as well, to use this library, to use the ideas and concepts behind it. But um, you have to know what you are doing and you have to know what it means to run um, your CI inside a container. And um, there are basically two ways um, how, you, how you can um, use Docker inside a container. And I want to quickly go over it. And if you want to implement it or need to implement it, you have to look it up in the internet. It's, there are examples how you do it in a good fashion. For example, GitLab, which supports Docker um, build containers out of the box, has um, all the different strategies um, explained in the documentation. One version is to use Docker in Docker. This means having a Docker engine running inside my Docker container. And if I do this and I run the, the test we've seen before, it would start the uh, new Docker containers inside um, the, the build container. This works in theory. Some people use this pattern, but um, how is he called? I think Jerome. Um, he's one of the Docker developers, and uh, he actually advises against using Docker and Docker. So they made a blog post about using Docker and Docker, I don't know, five, six years ago? Or no, it can't be that long ago. Docker isn't that old. Maybe two or three years ago. It doesn't matter at this point. Um, and they said how to use Docker and Docker, and they use it to develop Docker, because it's easier to build Docker inside Docker, seemingly. And... Um, so everyone thought, oh, Docker and Docker, that's so cool. We built our CI pipeline on this. And then he said, yeah, not, not so good. We are the Docker developers, and we advise you it might be a bad idea. And then uh, he had this uh, picture in the blog post where he said, don't do this. And uh, yeah, they, they say themselves they don't know what happens if you run Docker and Docker for production-like stuff. It's not, use, it's, it's not built for this, right now at least. The other thing, that, that's what we're using, and that's what's generally advised uh, mostly, is to use uh, the Docker wormhole pattern. And in this case, you are mounting the Docker socket. You can mount files, and the socket is in a Linux file system kind of a file, I think. So you can mount the socket into your Docker container, into your build container. Then the Docker client inside the container can interact with the underlying Docker engine, and um, it's, uh, the pattern is basically like this. So we have this Docker engine. This is our build container. You mount the socket into this. If, it, if the Docker client inside the build container will interact with the uh, Docker engine using the socket, it will actually talk to the underlying engine and containers. And that's very important to know. 
then you won't be able uh, to access them using localhost, for example, because they won't be running on localhost inside the container. And that's one of the details you have to keep in mind, and there are uh, techniques how, um, how to work with this. So, yeah, it's, if, if, you, build it, if uh, you set it up, you just have to know what you're doing. You have to know uh, what it means for mounting files from inside your build container if the container you are spawning are siblings and not children of your container. So keep in mind, you have to know what you're doing if you are having a setup like this, or it might be totally confusing. Now, let's come to the end. What's, what does the future hold for, for this project, for this idea for test containers, for test container Spock? Um, I think in the future we will build up better support for Docker networking, so you don't have to rely on some kind of host port binding, which would mean you can always interact with the containers in a DNS-like fashion, which of course would mean you can now again statically configure the um, URLs of your test database in like your uh, Spring Data Test. You don't have to inject the configuration at runtime, which would make it so much more usable. And uh, it will work, um, yeah, and then it will work much better. We want to uh, improve Windows support. We have basic support for uh, Docker for Windows, but uh, we're still lacking the Docker Compose support for Windows. And also what we wanted, uh, or what I would like to achieve someone is a transparent way from inside my IDE or a test or a debug, it will actually do everything in a container, but the, it's, it's transparent for the IDE, the IDE won't know this. And uh, gladly Mario showed me something, uh, how I might be able to achieve this, or how he er already has achieved it, and the idea is running IntelliJ inside a container. Then all builds will run in container, and it works perfectly. So as far as I see, it works perfectly. I will, I will try to Im improve on this idea, and then maybe have a blog post or whatever about it. Okay, here are the links. I will Twitter the link to the slides, and you can get the link to the GitHub and so on um, from there. And that's it. There I gave all my Photoshop skills that were, that were inside me, and I put the Duke next to the Docker mascots. So you see they all um, get along really well. And um, yeah, that's the end of my talk. Thank you. There's one minute left for questions. Yes. So in your test, you've used um, the Docker image from the Docker Hub, right? Yeah. So if I have a custom image, can I anyway? Yeah. You just define the normal image URL, and if you have a custom image, it would normally, uh, in your repository maybe, then it would contain the URL of your registry, and then it would pull it there. The Docker engine has, of course, to be has, of course. Uh, to be authorized, so you have, like before, do Docker login or whatever to access your private registry, but outside of your test, yeah. That's, that's possible as well, yeah. You have to look it up in documentation, I never do this. <laughs> Um, I, I don't feel so good about continuous testing with um, Java, to be honest. I think it feels slow. So you mean like having Gradle run in the background and run the unit test on every change? Yeah, yeah so my experiences with doing it with Java aren't so good. It feels kind of sluggish, but your feeling might, uh, might be different. And I think continuous testing with integration tests seems very heavyweight. But I'm not sure. I haven't tried it. Might, might work. Okay, thank you.